If you want to learn about shell and tube heat exchangers, this is the video for you. I'm going to run you through all of the components and parts that make up a shell and tube heat exchanger. I'm going to show you how it works, and then we'll talk briefly about the advantages and disadvantages associated with this type of heat exchanger. Here is a shell and tube heat exchanger. You can see that it has a long cylindrical shape. That long cylinder is the shell. And if we change this up a bit, you can see the shell. We can go through it. It's got an inlet and an outlet. As you can see, here is one connection. You can see that flow goes into the shell here. And then we have another connection down here that allows flow out of the shell. Keep in mind, it might not always be that way. The flow direction can change. Within the shell, we have tubes. They're essentially long pipes that have been placed within our heat exchanger shell. We put tube sheets on the end of our tubes. This ensures that the tubes stay in position. You can see there's a tube sheet at either end of the tubes. Those tube sheets give the tubes mechanical strength. And also they provide a seal so that as the shell side fluid, that is the fluid that flows in through this connection here, and then flows around the tubes on the outside of the tubes and then down here. As it does so, we don't get any leakage out from our shell because we've got the tube sheets sealing off either end of our shell. The fluid that flows around the tubes is called the shell side fluid. So it makes sense that the fluid flowing through our tubes is called the tube side fluid. You can see that these tubes, they have nothing within them. We can just pass our fluid through the tubes from one end to the other. Because the tube sheets are manufactured from metal or some sort of alloy, they're going to require gaskets in order to seal correctly. If I take the tube sheet off for a moment, you'll see that over here, this black mark represents our gasket. We install it there so that when we add the tube sheets, they can press up against the gaskets and that will give us a seal. Designs always vary though, so this is just for demonstration purposes. You can see that if the tube sheet pressed against that gasket, if the shell body pressed against the gasket, then we would get a seal that does not allow any fluid to flow out. The only other part that we need to discuss now is the baffles. You can see that the baffles have an alternating pattern. They're installed with one up, one down, one up, one down, one up, one down, and then the shell side fluid flows out through this connection. Why would we do that? The reason we do it is because the shell side fluid comes in here and it flows downwards. Due to the baffles, it's going to flow down to the bottom of the shell, as we can see here. And then it's going to flow under that baffle, up here, across here, down here, to the right, and then upwards and across and then down. And then it will continue flowing until it leaves the heat exchanger. By installing the baffles, we are directing the shell side fluid to flow over the tubes many times. This increases the heat exchange capacity of our heat exchanger. If we just had a shell and tube heat exchanger without baffles, what would happen is we would have a shell fluid coming in here. It would flow in, then it would just go straight to the end of our heat exchanger and then out through the discharge. We don't want that because that's not ideal. It's only going to flow a little bit over our tubes and then it will flow out via the path of least resistance. So if we install the baffles, we're ensuring that we're getting a change of direction many times, as you can see here. And that change of direction is what pushes the shell side fluid over the tubes. This particular shell and tube heat exchanger is called a one pass shell and tube heat exchanger because the tube side fluid, which flows in through the tubes at this end, and then out of the tubes at the opposite end, that tube side fluid only passes through the heat exchanger once. So this is a one pass shell and tube heat exchanger. Notice that we've used a red color over here to indicate that the fluid is hot, and then it cools down to something like a green fluid over here. We could have also made this orange or yellow, I guess, to signify that the fluid is being cooled down. On this side, we've got a cold fluid going in, and as it passes through the heat exchanger, it gets slightly warmer. So we go from dark blue to light blue. The two fluids are flowing in counter directions because the shell side fluid is flowing to the right and the tube side fluid is flowing to the left. 
They're opposing each other, they're flowing in counter directions. You have three main types of flow through all heat exchangers, counter, cross and parallel. You can see that we also have some cross flow because we're directing our tube side fluid across the tubes several times. So in this particular heat exchanger, we're using not only counter flow, but also cross flow. The type of flow that you use dictates the heat transfer rate, and sometimes you'll favor one type of flow over another because it's more desirable in a given process. As an example, you can see that our tube side fluid gets heated to its highest temperature at this point here, because that's the hottest temperature that the shell side fluid enters. Sometimes we may not want that. Maybe we want the shell side fluid to enter here at the same end as the tube side fluid. And there may be process reasons for this. This is very relevant in industries where we're manufacturing food and drink, such as chocolate or beer. These are processes where the temperature has to be very tightly controlled at all times. This is a very basic type of shell and tube heat exchanger. Let's take a look at one that's a bit more advanced. As you can see here, this one has got a few more parts. We've still got our shell, which is shown on the screen now. You can see also that there's a flange connection here, and there's one down here. Compared to our last one though, there are a few other differences. We've got a flange connection here, and then we've got another one over here. Not only that, we've got another component that's been added to the end of our heat exchanger. This particular component is called a bonnet. At the other end of the heat exchanger, we've got something called a header. The header is where the tube side fluids enter and leave the heat exchanger. If we take a cross section, we can see exactly how this heat exchanger works. Notice it looks quite similar. If we zoomed in here, it would look very similar to the heat exchanger that we just looked at. In fact, it's pretty much identical. When we move out though, now you can see there are differences. I'm gonna add some labels. You can see we've got our shell side fluid coming in again, and it's been discharged down here. This time though, we've got a tube side fluid coming in at the bottom and a tube side fluid going out at the top. How's it getting from down here to up here? Well, it's getting there because as the tube side fluid flows in here, it's directed into these tubes. It's not allowed to travel out of the heat exchanger because we've got this partition plate that stops the fluid going directly to the outlet. So the tube side fluid enters the tubes over here goes along the tubes, and then it's gonna come out of the lower half of the heat exchanger where all these tubes are shown on my screen now. You can see the dark blue arrows coming out. Because the flow at this point is contained within the bonnet, the bonnet makes up part of our pressure boundary. This is simply the boundary area where our fluid is contained within the system, in this case within the heat exchanger. But as you can see, the dark blue arrows come out the process fluid then gets turned around and we get the fluid entering back into the upper half of the tubes within the heat exchanger. And you can see those light blue arrows going into those tubes. It will be all of these tubes here. We're going to get flow into those tubes because of the pressure difference from where the tube side fluid enters compared to where it's discharged. The light blue fluid comes out of these tubes here in the top half of the heat exchanger and then it's directed up and out of the heat exchanger. This type of heat exchanger is called a two-pass heat exchanger. Once again, because it's named after how many times the tube side fluid has to pass through the heat exchanger. In our example here, the tube side fluid flows left to right and then right to left, and that's what makes it a two-pass heat exchanger. Notice that in the lower half of the heat exchanger, the tube side fluid flows in parallel with our shell side fluid. But in the upper half of our heat exchanger, the tube side fluid flows counter to the shell side fluid. Not only that, we also have some cross flow as the shell side fluid crosses over the tubes several times within the heat exchanger. So these are all different flow patterns that are occurring within our heat exchanger. Let's take a look at a different shell and tube heat exchanger design, which has a similar working principle, but is slightly different. As you can see here, this heat exchanger looks identical to the one we just looked at. But if we take a cross section, you'll see at the end over here, we've got a very unusual design. This design is called a U-tube shell and tube heat exchanger. 
It's called a U-tube design because the tubes have this U-bend shape. This is how the tubes would look if you remove them from the heat exchanger. They're still straight, as we saw previously, but the lower half directs the fluid along here, assuming the fluid flows in from the bottom and out of the top. And then it's going to do a U-turn, if you follow my mouse, around here and then back the other way. Similar to what we saw a moment ago, but this time we're directing the tube side fluid using the tubes rather than allowing the fluid to flow out and into the bonnet. You'll usually have an expansion joint with this type of heat exchanger that just allows for the heat exchanger to expand and contract as it increases in temperature and decreases in temperature. Notice for all other aspects though, this heat exchanger is identical to the two pass type heat exchanger that we looked at a moment ago, only the tubes in the bonnet are different. So why would we use a shell and tube heat exchanger instead of a plate heat exchanger or a spiral heat exchanger? Well, shell and tube heat exchangers are probably the most popular type of heat exchanger in the world. The main reason for this is because they're cheap. They're cheap, they're easy to maintain, they have a simple design. For their size, they have quite a good heat transfer capacity and they can handle a wide range of temperatures and pressures. If you construct the shell and tube heat exchanger from special alloys and materials, this would also enable it to operate in quite corrosive and erosive environments. Some designs even have what's called a double walled design, and that's where we put the tubes within our shell and tube heat exchanger within other tubes. These tubes are then monitored for leakage so that if our inner tube should develop a leak, the leaking fluid will pass from our inner tube to our outer tube and within our outer tube we'll monitor for leakage so that we can identify if any process fluid is leaking from our inner tube to our outer tube. This is very advantageous if our process fluid is toxic, flammable, explosive or poisonous. The final advantage we have with a shell and tube heat exchanger is that if we get a leak on one of our tubes we can block off that tube and although we'll get a reduced heat transfer capacity because the tube is now blocked and we can't use it for exchanging heat, we can still keep the heat exchanger in service. Not only that, it's relatively easy to find leaks in shell and tube heat exchangers compared to other types of heat exchanger. This is because we can block off tubes individually, pressurize them and then wait to see if the tubes hold the pressure. If they don't, then we know that the tube is leaking. So it's very easy to identify a leak within a shell and tube heat exchanger. And once done so, we can simply block off the tube and then put the heat exchanger back into service. There are, however, some disadvantages associated with shell and tube heat exchangers. The biggest disadvantage is due to the large footprint that the heat exchanger requires compared to other types of heat exchanger, for example, a plate heat exchanger. They're also less efficient for low flow and low temperature applications. And another slight inconvenience is that when you disassemble the shell and tube heat exchanger to perform maintenance, you may require a lot of space. In order to pull the tubes out of the shell and tube heat exchanger, it needs to be installed in an area that allows you to do this. That means the surrounding area has to have a minimum of one tube length of space in order that we can pull each tube all the way out of the heat exchanger. I hope you've enjoyed this video on shell and tube heat exchangers. Don't forget to check out our other video on plate heat exchangers and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. At Savory.com, we have over 100 hours of engineering video tutorials, over 500 interactive 3D models, just like those shown in this video, and all of those models work directly through a web browser. So if you want to teach, learn, instruct, or do anything related to engineering, come and visit us at savory.com. Thanks very much for your time.